Morgan for something? Okay. Hi, I'm Jay Ferry. And I'm Jane Lowry. I'm chairman of Eagle County Republicans. And I'm the Democrat. <laughs> Yeah, we'd like to welcome you tonight, but we'd like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance, please, and uh, a moment of silence for the victims of 9-11. Gary Burkholder will uh, lead us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We'll have a moment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is the first of two debates we're holding before the ne November election. Tonight we're having debates between the Senate 5 candidates and the House District 26 candidates. Uh, next Tuesday we'll have county commissioners, the sheriff, and the coroner races, and followed by remarks for the uncontested races of the treasurer, the county clerk, the assessor, and the surveyor. Um, tonight we have two moderators, Ron Robbins and Greg Johnson, and from this point on it's their show. Thanks for coming. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, this is being recorded, uh, it, it is live, uh, so uh, uh, we will keep things civil tonight, I'm sure. Uh, the format of this uh, debate is that each candidate will provide some introductory remarks of a couple minutes. Uh, they will then answer eight questions and then uh, provide uh, a couple more minutes of uh, closing remarks. Those eight questions we'll share, Ron and I, uh, in terms of uh, asking the candidates. And it will be structured such that uh, the first candidate will have a two minute time period to answer, then the second candidate will answer for two minutes, and then there'll be a 30 second rebuttal by the first candidate if they consider it necessary or worthwhile. Uh, we are encouraging the audience to provide questions to us. Uh, obviously, we do have time constraints tonight. We're asking you to provide those to us in writing. If we can work them in in the time period that's allowed, we will do so. Uh, maybe we'll even substitute them for one of uh, our questions. Uh, given that Ron was chosen by the Democratic side and I was chosen uh, by the Republic side to moderate tonight, uh, there's some balance in the choice of those questions. So again, we encourage you to provide them and uh, we'll see if we can work them in. Uh, let me see if there's any other of the, uh, no, and then I guess the only other comment would be that it will be the same format when we do the House uh, 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 debates uh, following this. In terms of uh, inter introducing the uh, candidates, uh, I think we should just go ahead and start with the two-minute introduction and let them introduce themselves, if that's acceptable. And Carrie, I believe you won the towing cost, so if uh, you'd like to start. Uh, thanks, I'll jump right in then. Uh, thank you to the Republican Party and the Democratic Parties of Eagle for hosting this debate tonight. And also, moderators, thank you for time, finding time in your busy days to work on this. I hope we all found time in our busy day today to reflect on the events of 13 years ago. Uh, I've spent the past year and a half traveling around the district of State Senate District 5, and what struck me is the diversity of the seven counties that make up State Senate District 5 stretching from uh, Chiefy over to Delta and, of course, Eagle in the north all the way down to Hinsdale in the south. And I think what's in important about that is that the number of different communities that make up this district will need a diverse voice to represent them well at the Capitol. And I believe that I'm uniquely suited to be that voice. Uh, you know, my time as an educator, seven years in a public school, uh, certainly has given me insight into the, the classrooms. In that same amount of time, I took over the helm of my family's ranch and been running that as a small business. And my time on the Vail Town Council was really enriching. That's a small town with a large budget and a national stage, and really was a great uh, preparing ground for, for being a state senator. What I've been hearing as I've been traveling around the seven counties of State Senate District 5 is that we need to create an economy that works for everyone and not just for the wealthy few. And that really resonates when you have conversations with uh, a young gentleman down in Gunnison who talked about, he said, honestly, I would like to vote for you, but I don't know if I'll be around November 4th because I can't find a job right now. And also chatting with, uh, just had a conversation last night with a man 
who was concerned about how he was going to pay for health care over the upcoming um, years. And so, you know, I was really raised with a value of service in my family. And I would like to continue that value of service by serving you as your next state senator of District 5. Thank you. Don. All right, thank you very much. Oh, I knew I'd forget. <laughs> uh, my name is Don Surface, and I am also running for State Senate here in District 5. Uh, as uh, my opponent stated, uh, Senate District 5 is quite large. Thank Delta to Salida and Lake City to Vail. Uh, I know the miles I've have been, uh, have been a lot of fun, and we've met a lot of great people here in this district. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am married to my beautiful wife, Beth, who is here tonight with me. And I thank her so much because without her, I would not be able to do this. We have four-year-old twin boys that are truly the light of my life. I am the mayor of Orchard City, twice elected. And I also own my own heating and cooling business out of, based out of Delta County. I understand the needs of small government, the needs of business when it comes to dealing with the state. We have been pushed around by a state of Colorado that is growing and getting very over-regulatory, very bureaucratic, and making it hard for the citizens in this state. We are suffering in jobs. We are suffering in incomes. We need to be able to build our economy to make it work for everybody, the working class to the industrial systems. We have to be able to have a good working economy if we want a healthy state and a viable economy. So thank you so much, and I want to thank uh, Eagle County Republicans and Democrats for hosting this, and uh, Eagle County themselves for allowing us to use this room. So thank you. Thank you, Don. And if I could correct one oversight in my opening remarks, our very efficient timekeeper here is John Knopf, and he'll also be collecting uh, uh, the questions you might have. So if you want to direct them down to him, he'll, he'll get them passed over to us. Thanks. By another coin flip, it was determined that I would ask the first question. I hope that the audience will forgive both Greg and my backs. And I hope the audience will understand, too, that both Greg and I have been invited to address Don and Carrie by their first names. So I hope you won't think us rude if we do so. Thank you. Nobody has ever asked me to be louder. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> the uh, perception, I think, among the public, and this question goes to Carrie first, the perception among the public, I think, at all levels of government, is that Democrats and Republicans have failed to work well and effectively together for some period of time. The first question that I have for each of you is, is if elected, what concrete acts would you take to reach across the aisle and be effective? Uh, thanks for that question. I, I think it, it is a problem that we have now. And, and perception, I think, doesn't always match reality. I, I watched a significant number of the uh, Senate um, uh, feeds from Denver this year, and over 90% of those bills were passed in a bipartisan manner. That being said, that shows the importance of needing to work across that aisle, and an effective legislator will be someone who can bring uh, everyone together of diverse interests in order to create strong coalitions and teamwork to then tackle the uh, challenges that State Senate District 5 uh, has. But to your question, a specific move to, to work towards ending the bipartisanship when it does become a roadblock, I would really like to, on day one down in Denver in January, create a Western Slope Caucus. That's not something that exists right now. I think there's an amazing opportunity there to bring together all the legislators of the Western Slope and, and start being a unified voice when those issues come in front that we need to be a unified voice. I also, of course, would include in that um, Chiefy County, which is the Arkansas Valley, but they tend to align more so with the rural Western issues than with the Front Range urban issues. So that's a very specific a very precise task that I will uh, take on immediately in January and, and create that Western Slope Caucus. Don, forgive me for just a moment. Yes. I presume that you uh, heard and understood the yes. question in anything I asked each of you. If you don't ask me, and I'll be happy to repeat it. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> a lot of the issues we are going to be facing in Colorado are not going to be Republican-Democrat issues. 
The issues we face in the next several years are gonna be urban versus rural issues, especially when it comes to our water, especially when it comes to our land use. These are the times where we need to make sure we have elected representatives that can stand up to their caucus and do what's right for their district. I will be that voice. I've got no problem standing up to my caucus and doing what's best for rural Colorado. Because too many times we have Western Slope legislators that vote with the Denver party of their choice far too many times and rural Colorado gets left out. So number one, we need to be able to have that rural voice. We need to be able to develop a good, strong Western, not only a Western Slope caucus, but a rural Colorado caucus so that we can have that voice. Even though we don't have the population numbers Denver do, we need to make sure that our voice is heard because we have the land, we have the resources, and we need to be able to do what's best with those because we're the ones that do know what's best, not the people in Denver. Uh, I'm glad you agree with my idea of building a Western Slope Caucus. I thought it was a pretty good one myself. And like I said, that doesn't exist now. So, you know, being able to do that in, in January would be a critical step to making sure that uh, a Western Slope Caucus can be a strong voice and bring, right? A Western Slope Caucus will be made up of Democrats and Republicans. So by creating a caucus of those Western Slope legislators, you've already created a team that has both parties represented in it. Thanks, I think I'm up, and I'll direct this to Don first. Do you support Senate Bill 13252, and do you believe it can achieve its objective of doubling renewable energy sources to 20% by the year 2020 without violating the 2% rate increase cap? I am absolutely opposed to Senate Bill 252. I know many people in the power producing industry, the power transmission industry, that have told me they've ran the numbers, there is no way that this is physically possible to achieve these mandates at the 2% increase. It just can't be done. The problem is 252 is putting the burden and the pain on working class and retired citizens. We have grandpa and grandma that are trying to decide between meals and medicine or whether they're gonna pay their electric bill. In rural Colorado, my family included, we've seen a jump in our electric bill already this year. My wife brought, called me up and said, wow, our bill went up quite a bit this year. I said, well, what was our usage? Well, it was down from last year. We are using less electricity. We are being more efficient and we're paying more money. We have to be smarter with how we are using electricity. There's no doubt. I work in the heating and cooling field. I have made a very good living for helping people become more efficient in their homes, having a smaller carbon footprint. It can be done. The problem is we cannot do it on the backs of the poor and working class and the retired citizens of this state. It is unethical and it is wrong. We have this mentality that we need to ship all of our jobs and all of our energy consumption across the sea to the west and let China and India do all our production for us with the coal and whatever means they have necessary. And they are not doing it as cleanly as we are here in the United States of America. It is clean energy that made America the manufacturing leading of the manufacturer leading of the world. Sorry, leading manufacturer of the world. So, thank you. I believe any discussion around energy should be in a conversation around opportunity. Uh, it's it's a real issue that down in Gunnison and and Delta counties. We had extremely well-trained workers that lost their jobs because of a worldwide trend away from coal energy. At the same time, when we look at 252, and, and sorry, I hate to get so numbery and, and jargony, um, uh, 252 was a clean energy bill. Um, so when we, when we look at clean energy, I see no reason why we can't turn Senate District 5 into a hub of a new energy economy to bring new um, safe jobs to all of our skilled workers that we already have here. 
And I think there's so many communities in the Western Slope and in the Arkansas Valley that are, are known for their innovation. We have small businesses that crop up all the time that uh, just are so surprising about what new idea they've had. So as a state senator, I'll be in a, I'll be in a position to have those important conversations to leverage the resources of the state and convince people that SD5, that State Senate District 5, is the place to invest in Colorado and also tout um, the tax rates and all the other work that the state legislature has done to make Colorado such an appealing place to start new business. So the conversation about energy should be a conversation about opportunity. We cannot waste this moment right now looking backwards. We've got to continue to look forward and create opportunities that, that increase and benefit the economy of SD5 and make it work for all of the citizens of State Senate District 5. And just to be clear, that means you do think that this can be done within the 2% cap? Yeah, thanks for allowing that clarification, asking that clarification. Yes, I do, and, and I'll tell you why, that even the Colorado Rural Electric Association believes that 252 can be good. They were concerned about the timings of the rollouts and being able to catch up with the implementation of a series of bills that have been passed down at the Capitol. But the Colorado, uh, the Colorado Rural Electric Association, CREA, has not suggested a repeal of 252. Does that clarify it further yeah. to your satisfaction? Thank you. Um, thank you. Just a, a couple of quick facts. Here in Colorado, we pay the second highest electric rates west of the Mississippi, behind California. They're the only ones higher. And we see what's happening to business and industry in California. It is leaving. Everybody says America is typically 15 to 20 years behind Europe, especially on energy issues. Well, guess what? Right now, Germany is in the process of building 18 coal-fired power plants. They've seen the error of their ways. They've seen what happens when people can't afford energy. Okay, I'm up here. Uh, this is, I'm gonna direct this to Carrie if I could. Uh, do you support the three new gun laws passed in 2013? Uh, if not, uh, would you support repeal of these laws? And the second part to that uh, question, do you support further restrictions on private gun, gun ownership? Could, uh, sorry, before I answer the question, could you clarify which three laws you were talking about? Because I believe there was five passed. Okay, the, the three I was particularly aware of uh, were the transfer, private transfer uh, private of private, guns, okay. the magazine uh, issue, and okay. there was one other that I'm blanking There was on either the um, uh, concealed carry permit in yes. person, yes. that was yes. the CC. Yep. Sure. Um, yeah, because the other two bills that were passed were kind of... Uh, partner bills for a lack of a technical term. Okay. Um, so uh, yes, uh, thank you for that question. And then you want to follow up with, I'm sorry, what was the second portion Just of it? Just if you were in favor of further restrictions on private gun ownership. Okay. Uh, let, I'll start there and then work back to the other three laws, if you, if you don't mind. Um, I, no, at, at this time, I do not uh, support any further restrictions on gun ownership. Uh, as, a, as a rancher, those uh, gun is really a, a tool. And as uh, growing up in a hunting family where our transition, it's actually this weekend, the transition to summer to fall was marked by nothing more than black powder season. And so I, I certainly appreciate that on the Western Slope, we have a different culture of guns here. And that's, a, that's important as a state senator to be able to express that different in culture and give, uh, give a broader voice in those discussions. So now let me get to addressing the first part of the question, the three specific laws you wanted me to comment on. Uh, I, I would not have supported the 15 round magazine limit. I don't think it's an enforceable law, and I think we've heard that from many of our law enforcement officials across the state. The private to private uh, gun transfer background check uh, prevents dangerous criminals from getting guns, and I believe I stand on the side of most members from uh, most of the constituency of SD5 and other sportsmen believing that, that was the final loophole in the background check system to be closed. And finally, um, I think the concealed carry permit 
And sorry, I'm having to explain them and give my position on them as well, just so everyone knows what we're talking about. But the concealed carry permit law was saying that if you want the right to carry a concealed gun, you need to go in person and take those testings and do those classings in person. That seems like a very uh, obvious law that, that I support. I think that one makes a lot of sense. That's a common, safe, common sense gun safety law that I have no problem standing behind. Uh, thank you very much. Or are you no, we're, we're good. Um, okay. I, I absolutely disagree with these gun laws 100%. They are in violation of the Constitution. Our Second Amendment is very clearly written when it comes to the ownership and the possession of arms. I don't believe that the problem with guns is our current situation. Oh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. I don't believe the gun problem can be fixed by punishing the law-abiding citizen. And that is what these bills did. These bills punished the law-abiding citizen rather than going after the criminals that commit the crime. We have to get smarter when we are writing our gun laws that we go after the people committing the crimes. We have to be better at helping with mental health. Right now, mental health in this state is woefully underfunded. I've talked to several sheriffs in this district. That is a common theme throughout this district. We need more mental health funding. These guys are taking people in. They need help. They need, they need somebody to talk to, and they're getting turned away because there's not enough money. The problem isn't the guns. We need to fix these laws, and I will be all for repealing these gun laws. Carrie? Yes, there is, there is an Pardon. There was an addition I would like to make uh, a comment on the uh, part, of, part of the legislation that was passed. I think we also need to, and this is coming from conversations I've had with not only our local gun shop owner, but as a gun shop owner over in the Roaring Fork Valley as well, that there needs to be some further work done by the state in looking at the burden on small business and also making sure that the state is supporting these small businesses and gun shop owners uh, as they try to follow the new laws. So that's another aspect that I'd like to work on. Thank you. Uh, this question goes to Don first. And forgive me if I'm a little esoteric, but hang with me, you'll get it. Rabbi Hillel, the uh, first century BCE uh, scholar and theologian, was once famously asked to explain the Torah while standing on one foot. I'm going to ask you each to at least metaphorically stand on one foot and summarize who you are, what you stand for, and what you believe. Okay. That's easy. I don't even have to do it on one foot. Um, I am a small businessman. I am a small government man. I have made it my career and my life in public service to be efficient and effective with the taxpayer dollar and I have been very successful at it as a mayor of Orchard City. Orchard City has probably got one of the best looking financial statements of any municipality in the state, and that is because it takes some real leadership and it takes somebody to stand on their principles when it comes to protecting the taxpayer dollar. I also understand what happens when unfunded mandates get pushed down from federal and state agencies, whether it be municipalities, counties, school districts, any special district you can imagine. It becomes more expensive, and guess what? They're going to pass that cost on to the end user, the taxpayer, same way with business. Business in this state is the tax collector, the debt collector, the regulation enforcer. Colorado should be better to its businesses. It is the businesses that are bringing in the money and keeping this state alive. And I am all for business and making business better because when business is better, families have more money. When families have more money, life is just better. Carrie. Uh, I was already able to comment on, I think, the, the diversity of, of roles that I've held in my experience that I think qualifies me to be a good legislator, but I feel like you're going a little bit more esoteric in your question, so I'm going to try to go a little bit more uh, philosophical, perhaps, in my answer. Uh, I was raised with a, a full belief um, that your word is your worth, and that's what makes 
your last name mean anything? And I think the, the history of my parents in this valley, of my, my, my family has done here, has, has certainly built up a reputation I'm very proud of. Our word is our worth. And I'm proud, I'm proud to be a Donovan in Eagle County. Um, also, a, a value of service to your community. Uh, that's what pushed me into the education field. And it's, it's why I really enjoyed my seven years there, is a real family value of, of serving your community in whatever way possible. And when you're doing that service, you do it with a real commitment to hard work. And that value of hard work is reflected in everything I've touched, but certainly as I've taken over the helm of my family's ranch. Um, that's been definitely a school of hard knocks. But I think anyone who's ever seen me in my ranching attire or when I've been able to talk with other ranchers in the community, there's no way you run a ranch uh, without extremely long hours and hard work. So uh, your word is your worth, a commitment to service, and a commitment to doing hard work would be my standing on one leg answer for you. Um, I don't have much to add. You know, my, uh, my dad was a policeman in Delta where I grew up for 28 years. He was chief for 10 of that. Um, but, you know, that alone doesn't qualify me to run for state senate. What qualifies me to run for state senate is my abilities as a businessman, what I've done as a mayor, and what I've, I have done to serve the community. Next question is also mine and uh, goes to, um, where did we start? Carrie. It goes with Carrie. <laughs> I'm sorry. As a state senator, what do you think is the foremost legislative concern for Eagle County? For Eagle County, I think the foremost uh, legislative concerns are two. The first one is going to be with infrastructure, and the second one is with health care. And this is what I've been hearing during a lot of meaningful conversations on doors and on, on porches with folks um, over in the Roaring Fork Valley part of Eagle County as well as uh, the greater Eagle Valley part of Eagle County. Uh, so let me address the first one, infrastructure. That primarily becomes a discussion about I-70. And solutions for I-70 are big solutions. And the way you get those issues solved is you are a constant and strong voice for the I-70 corridor at the Capitol as a state senator. I believe that we can attack the I-70 issue in two ways. One, with continuing innovative solutions that look at social media as a way to encourage off-peak travel. Uh, ideas like that, but we can't pr we can't forget bricks and mortar solutions. Otherwise, uh, while we're having a uh, conversation about social media, bricks and mortar solutions means finding the dollars to do projects along the entire I-70 corridor that make that an efficient and effective transportation vein. I'll, the other one that I talked about was healthcare. That's a broader discussion. Um, it is. It has many aspects to it. One is just the simple ability to afford health care. Uh, as we all know, the ACA rollout in the, the high country came with it some pretty disastrous fees that we're feeling the burden of. So it's we need to work on that issue in particular. But also having a broader, a broader effort on improving uh, health care in Eagle County. And I think we can do that by attracting health and wellness industries and companies to the Eagle County, which would make health care more affordable and more accessible. You know, as the time I've spent in Eagle County in the last year and a half, um, I kind of question, you know, what happened with Eagle County and CDOT? Holy cow. Um, you know, somebody needs to send somebody some flowers somewhere. It is, it is, it is amazing as I travel the district, it seems like the most road problems and road construction mishaps seem to happen in Eagle County. So, uh, obviously something needs to be done with CDOT on that level that, uh, you know, we start worrying about what gets done within the borders of Eagle County. I, uh, for the tourism industry, for everything that Eagle County has to offer, you have to have transportation to get back and forth to Denver. That's just part of it. It's part of the part of life in Eagle County. And that is one of my very big goals as Senator 
is to try to deal with these situations with CDOT, to deal with the road closer issues on I-70 during the winter time. We've had so many road closures this last winter. Granted, we had some snow, but we've had more snow in the past with less closures. The road conditions are absolutely out of control. What the poor people of the town of Eagle are going through out here on the, on the interstate is just incredible. So that's probably the number one goal as far as Eagle County goes when it comes to the time in the state legislature because transportation has just got to be key. That is one of the foremost requirements of government is good roads to get goods to, to service to market. Gary? I think signaling out CDOT as the bad guy is oversimplifying the problem. And when I was on the Vail Town Council, we had a great working relationship with CDOT and talking about uh, solutions uh, for the, the Vail Pass corridor. And I think we made some real progress on that, uh, simply just talking about who is responsible for which sections. That very simple, open, frank discussion uh, moved the needle on, on how the, the town of Vail was able to handle some I-70 congestion. I believe it's, uh, I'm up and this question is to Don. Uh, Senate bills 251 and 33 provide for driver's license and in-state tuition rates respectively for those who cannot prove they are in this country legally. Do you believe these benefits or laws uh, could possibly encourage further illegal immigration, especially with regard to teenagers and children? Um. Los entes mexicanos y nosotros quieren mismos. Queremos dinero buenos, quiero trabajos buenos, quiero seguridad para las familias. In essence, the Mexican folks that have come here, whether legally or illegally, they want the same things we do. They want jobs, they want a place to raise their family, they want safety for their family, they want security. Our problems with in-state tuition are not, that's not the issue here. We have kids that we're paying for them to go to school that are here illegally. K through 12, we are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on a child's education. Then we are sending them to college, giving them in-state tuition to no avail because they can't get a job. They're not legal citizens. I have had conversations with Scott Tipton and other US representatives on this issue. This is a federal issue that needs to be resolved. We have people here that want to be citizens. We have people here that just want a job. We have to fix this issue. Sad thing is, on a state level, anything we do is not fixing the issue. We need to push the federal government to fix the issue. And do you think what, just to be clear, do you think what was done on the state level then, the benefits outweigh any possible detriments of those bills? I, the, 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 once again, the, the problem is, is the benefits are, are pandering. We are, we are pandering because we're not fixing the problem. Just because we give somebody in-state tuition and they graduate with a great degree from one of our Colorado institutions does not mean that they get a job. So it's, it's not fixing the problem. We have to fix the problem. Carrie? Uh, as, a, as a state senator, the, the critical and broader conversation of, of immigration reform, the role there will be to pressure the Congress to make meaningful movement on this issue. To specifically comment on the, the two bills that you talked about, which I think are the asset bill and the driver's license bill, um, the, the asset bill was a way for, um, for undocumented um, students and workers to pay the same rates to go to college as, as anyone else. I think when we get any young person into our college system, it creates a better overall community. And I, I don't think that it would encourage any increase um, immigration into Colorado. The driver's license bill that you referred to, I think, is a great attempt by the state of Colorado to be proactive while DC is being so inactive. 
And while it has had some failures in its rollout because of its underfunding and a uh, few uh, locations where it is available, I think it does do the job of, of bringing everyone into the system and making uh, this state as a whole uh, safer. Um, you know, I get out, I talk to a lot of these folks, you know, in, not only in my profession on the job do I get to talk to them, but out on the campaign trail, I've got a chance to talk to a lot of them. They, you know, the more that we pr promote these types of programs, the more will come. To say that it's not going to increase the amount of illegal traffic to this state, that is just naive. But we have some serious financial and budget issues that we have to worry about in this state that take care of our citizens, not just the illegal ones. Thank you. Uh, my next question is to Kerry. Uh, if not for its defeat at the polls, Amendment 66 would have been the largest tax increase in Colorado's history, ostensibly for improving education. As I understand, this amendment has the chance of resurfacing in future years. Uh, because of the nature of the way it was put together. If it did so, would you support it? Uh, and uh, would you support it despite, I think, the reason that it was uh, uh, lost by a margin of about two to one of its perceived lack of educational objectives and measurements? Right. Uh, right. Amendment uh, 66 was an attempt over a year ago to find some increased funds to support educational, uh, new educational ideas in the state of Colorado. And you're, you're right, it was soundly defeated. Uh, but what I've seen in the, the classroom is there's real work to be done. We have created over a series of um, initiatives coming from the Capitol an incredible testing burden on our students. My sixth grade students spend 30% of their time in a classroom taking tests. Additionally to that, uh, serving alongside teachers, uh, having conversations with administrators, we have another very serious issue about funding our students in this state. We are 43rd in the country of the level that we fund students. That is not a value that I think Colorado should be okay with. The budget should be a reflection of our values and Colorado clearly values education. We have one of the most educated populations in the country, but we're not growing them at home. We're importing that education. What we have to do is go down and look at programs that work and continue to fund those, but also not be afraid to do the hard work of finding programs that don't work and eliminating those until we do that work, until we as state senators sit down and make sure that we don't have any inefficiencies in the programs that we are funding or the mandates that are pushing out, I don't think the voters of Colorado are gonna tolerate another tax increase. And, and just to be sure I understood that, and since that wasn't in Amendment 66 the way it was first presented, it sounds like you wouldn't have supported it if it resurfaced in its exact same form. I would, until, until we go down and take a hard look at where we can cut and um, find ineffective or inefficient programs that exist in the budget either, right? We need to look at, we need to look at the state's budget and make sure it's running lean and mean. <clears throat> before we can have any expectation of putting any tax increase out there. A request for a tax increase, excuse Thank me. You. That answers it. Don? Um, I absolutely would not support Amendment 66 again. I did not support it last time. Amendment 23 of our state constitution is very specific when it comes to school funding. Last year, we had a fairly good year in Colorado as far as government revenue goes. The democratically controlled legislature could have used that money for education. They chose not to. Instead, they came to us for a tax increase. I will agree with my opponent. I don't think the taxpayers of Colorado will vote for another tax increase, especially one that is just an open-end bar tab that does not have any proven results. We have to go back to local control of our education. What works in Vail 
is not necessarily going to work in Delta. We have to be able to give our local school districts the flexibility they need to spend the money they see fit the best way they can. Because not every school district is safe. Commerce City, Colorado, spends more money per pupil than any district in the state. They also have the lowest graduation rate. It's not about money. It's about the education system. We have great teachers in this state, fantastic teachers, but they are being held down by a system of rules that does not make it easy for them. I was visiting a school in Delta just the other day, and one of the administrators, he said, you know, if there's one thing you can do for us, more money, less rules. That's the consensus amongst the educators out there. They want less mandates coming down from the feds, less mandates coming down from the states. Let them teach the students the way they see fit with the qualified staff they have. Thank you. Gary, okay. any additional thoughts? <coughs> Yes, you know, I think there, there certainly is um, a discussion that you can't just throw money and money solves, solves everything. But, but just yesterday, I was told that um, by a mother who had um, two high school age kids that they were a junior and a senior and they had yet to have a textbook. And now they were going into an AP class where they were expected to wade through a college level text and they didn't even have the skills to know how to approach a textbook. So funding doesn't mean everything, but we have to have enough dollars to provide for the basic necessities to let a teacher teach. Thank you. My question goes to Don first, and I hope Greg will forgive me for speaking for both of us. But Greg and I have been limited by the creativity of our own minds in terms of questions to ask and by the limitation of four questions each. Uh, both of you have been campaigning now for several months. We're about eight weeks out from the election. I want to ask each of you where you believe you differ the most from your opponent. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. What I've noticed in the last probably 15 to 20 years that I've been involved in politics on, on a county level and witnessing, witnessing it at a state and national level, is we have a lot of Democrats that run as conservatives, and then when they take the oath of office, they remember their liberal roots. We have a current state senator from this district, which you folks did not vote for her because she got reapportioned into Eagle County. But she ran on a very conservative platform. She, every place she went, she taught conservative principles, conservative ideas, and then she goes to Denver, and she votes with Denver Democrats 98% of the time. I don't have that issue. What I have said is who I am. I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to, help to try to buy votes. I want people to vote for me because of what I say and that I will stand by what I say. And if they choose not to vote for me because of my principles, I respect them for that. But I will not be trying to talk a line someplace else to earn vote from somebody that it does not stand on the same side as me when it comes to principles. Gary? And, and sorry, I'll repeat the question because I know that the president of the Republican Party thought that it might not have come over the mic. So it was just a, a question about contrast the, as the, we have eight weeks leading into the... Right. The, the question specifically is where you believe you differ most from your opponent. Uh, Thank you. I'll, I'll focus on that, that one specifically then. I think where we differ most um, is, is our, our value of, of public lands and how we see those to the future of the state of Colorado. And I'm just going to touch on this one issue because I think it is one of our most critical differences. Uh, public lands in the state of Colorado provide um, a $17 billion industry. It's a huge economic driver of the state of Colorado and of the seven counties of SD5. As hunters, as fishermen, as rafters, as hikers, uh, BLM and our federal lands are critical to our economy and to the quality of life in these seven counties. I think we must uh, be very cognizant of any discussion that moves away from those protections on those public lands 
and keeping them under control of the BLM. The BLM manages lands to protect resources for everyone and multi-uses on all of those lands and for future generations. When we talk about removing public lands and turning them back over to the state, the state land board manages lands to make money. There's nothing wrong with that for the parcels that they do get to manage to create money for our schools, but turning over the immense amount of public land in SD5 to a state-controlled board is either gonna result it, because all state lands are private. Any, any land run by the state land board is private land. So any discussion or proposition of talking about turning those public lands back over to the state to be controlled by the state land board, I think is a very critical difference. Alan, you have rebuttal time. Thank you very much. Um, what what uh, my opponent is referring to is uh, the American Lands Council approach that's being taken in Utah right now. Um, the Utah, the state of Utah is tired of the federal government coming in and denying access and use of the public lands currently held by the feds. I personally am, I really hope that the federal government can use these public lands with us and let us enjoy not only access to them, but the minerals and everything else that goes along with them. But we have to be able to hold the federal government, we have to be able to hold their feet to the fire when it comes to that. We have reached uh, closing statements. And Carrie, since you went first on opening statements, Don will get the last remark. So you're first. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you were going to yell at no, no. my apologies. <laughs> I was settling back into my I seat. I need to be more clear. <laughs> no, I think that's me, not you. Um, thanks again, everyone, for your time this evening and participating in this important part of the democratic process. You all have an important decision to make this election season uh, when you decide who to, who to vote for. And remember to look for your ballots in the middle of October. This is um, coming off the, the last question, I think, is a perfect segue to talk about that often when you're making a decision between candidates to look for contrast and then base your decision on that. And I, I think there is real contrast beyond us, just beyond the, the public lands question that we just addressed. I believe in keeping public lands public. Uh, I also think that any, any conversation when we talk about energy is another clear line of contrast. And I believe you can't look backwards. There is no opportunity when you look backwards. We've got to seize this moment in time and create a new energy economy for SD5. And, and finally, I think there's contrast between us also in the field of education. Uh, my experience with, with my experience in a public school will allow me to be a strong and informed voice as a state senator down in, in SD5. Um, state Senate District 5 is filled with numerous communities with diverse needs and diverse personalities, and they'll need a voice that can speak for all the constituents of Senate District 5 and those seven counties. And I'm qualified to work for everyone that makes up State Senate District 5 as an educator, as a rancher, and as my experience on the town of Vale, um, I have that voice that will be respected by my fellow legislators and will be the voice for the people of this district. Um, I, wear ski boot, I wear ski boots and I wear cowboy boots, and that means that I can go down there and walk a lot of different lines for everyone. So I really hope that I can serve as your next uh, state senator, and I ask you for your vote. Thank you. Don, final comments. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, guys so much for the questions. Timekeeper, it's not an easy job. You guys did a great job, so thank you guys so much. Um, you know, segueing off of uh, what my opponent just said, you know, we talk about a new energy economy in SD5. I happen to personally know a lot of the 300 coal miners that lost their jobs in Delta County. I personally know the about 1,000 people that are facing losing their jobs because of the loss of those jobs at the coal mine. And yes, would I absolutely love to be able to have a new, vibrant energy economy in SD5? Absolutely. 
but the sheer economics don't work that way. If we push this any harder, any farther, it will be the working class, the retired, that pay the price. We cannot do that to them anymore. They're already suffering as it is. Currently, Colorado is looking at $4,000 less per year in annual income. Unemployment's down, but guess what? So are paychecks. We need to build the paychecks. We need to build the business economy. I'm a small businessman. I understand business. I'm a small government guy. I understand what it takes to run an effective government, and I have a track record to prove it. So thank you all so much for coming tonight. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. I don't know how to cut that straight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Doc.